for your reading for today. Before we begin, happy Friday. Um, obviously, we've had a week now of reading Fantastic Mr. Fox. We hope you've been enjoying reading it. Um, so just have a reflect and back on what you've read so far. Can you understand why the book is called Fantastic Mr. Fox? What has he done so far that makes him fantastic, in your opinion? Have a little ponder about that before moving on. Okay, so we're finishing the week with chapter 10 and chapter 11. Okay, so remember, pause when you get a new page on, try and read it yourself, and then press play for me to read for you. Chapter 10, Bogus's Chicken House number one. This time we must go in a very special direction, said Mr Fox, pointing sideways and downward. So he and his four children started to dig once again. The work went much more slowly now, yet they kept at it with great courage, and little by little the tunnel began to grow. Dad, I wish you would tell us where we are going, said one of the children. I dare not do that, said Mr Fox, because this place I am hoping to get to is so marvellous that if I described it to you now, you would go crazy with excitement. And then, if we fail to get there, which is very possible, you would die of disappointment. I don't want to raise your hopes too much, my darling. For a long time, they kept on digging. For how long, they did not know, because there were no days and no nights down there in the murky tunnel but at last mr fox gave the order to stop i think he said we had better take a peep upstairs now and see where we are i know where i want to be but i can't possibly sh be sure we're anywhere near it slowly warily the foxes began to slope the tunnel up towards the surface up and up it went until suddenly they came to something hard above their heads and they couldn't go any further. Mr Fox reached up to examine this hard thing. It's wood, he whispered. Wooden planks. What does that mean, Dad? It means, unless I am very much mistaken, that we are right underneath somebody's house, whispered Mr Fox. Be very quiet now while I take a peek. Carefully. Mr Fox began pushing up one of the floorboards. The board creaked most terribly and they all ducked down, waiting for something awful to happen. Nothing did. So Mr Fox pushed up a second board and then, very, very cautiously, he poked his head up through the gap. He let out a shriek of excitement. I've done it, he yelled. I've done it. First time, I've done it, I've done it. He pulled himself up through the gap in the floor and started prancing and dancing with joy. Come on up, he sang out. Come up and see where you are, my darlings. What a sight for a hungry fox. Hallelujah, hooray, hooray. The four small foxes scrambled up out of the tunnel and what a fantastic sight it was that now met their eyes. They were in a huge shed and the whole place was teeming with chickens. There were white chickens and brown chickens and black chickens by the thousand. Bogus's chicken house number one, cried Mr Fox. It's exactly what I was aiming at. I hit it slap in the middle. First time. Isn't that fantastic? And, if I say so, rather clever. The small foxes went wild with excitement. They started running around in all directions, chasing the stupid chickens. Wait, ordered Mr Fox. Don't lose your heads. Stand back. Calm down. Let's do this properly. First of all, everybody have a drink of water. They all ran over to the chicken's drinking trough and lapped up the lovely cool water. Then Mr Fox chose three of the plumpest hens and with a clever flick of his jaws, he killed them instantly. Back to the tunnel, he ordered. Come on. No fooling around. The quicker you move, the quicker you shall have something to eat. One after another... They climbed down through the hole in the floor and soon they were all standing once again in the dark tunnel. Mr Fox reached up and pulled the floorboards back into place. He did this with great care. He did it so that no one could tell they had ever been moved. My son, he said, giving the three plump hens to the biggest of his four small children. Run back with these to your mother. 
Tell her to prepare a feast. Tell her the rest of us will be along in a jiffy as soon as we have made a few other little arrangements. Chapter 11. A surprise for Mrs Fox. The small fox ran back along the tunnel as fast as he could, carrying the three plump hens. He was exploding with joy. Just wait, he kept thinking. Just wait till mummy sees these. He had a long way to run, but he never stopped once on the way, and he came bursting in upon Mrs Fox. Mummy, he cried out of breath. Look, mummy, look. Wake up and see what I've bought you. Mrs Fox, who was weaker than ever now from lack of food, opened one eye and looked at the hens. I'm dreaming, she murmured and closed the eye again. You're not dreaming, mummy, they're real chickens, we're saved. We're not going to starve. Mrs Fox opened both eyes and sat up quickly. But my dear child, she cried, where on earth? Boggis is chicken house number one, spluttered the small fox. We tunnelled right up under the floor and you've never seen so many big fat hens in all your life. And Dad said to prepare a feast. They'll be back soon. The sight of food seemed to give new strength to Mrs Fox. A feast it shall be, she said, standing up. Oh, what a fantastic fox your father is. Hurry up, child, and start plucking those chickens. Far away down in the tunnel, the fantastic Mr Fox was saying, Now for the next bit, my darlings. This one will be easy as pie. All we have to do is dig another tunnel from here to there. To where, Dad? Don't ask so many questions. Start digging. Okay, so that's the end of chapter 11. Your five quickfire questions are... Question one. Why did the foxes know what time it was when they were digging... Sorry, that should say, why didn't the foxes know what time it was when they were digging the tunnel? Question two. Mr Fox is whispering... Why do you think that is? Question three, find and copy what Mr Fox says, which lets the reader know the tunnel came out where he had planned. Okay, that's a find and copy direct from the text, so there's no sentence then for that one. Question four, how does Roald Dahl describe how the little foxes reacted when they saw the chickens? And question five, what does the word plump mean on page 43? So just to clarify, guys, I've made an error there. I'm really sorry. That question should be, why didn't, why didn't the foxes know what time it was when they were digging the tunnel? Okay. So, your answers. The foxes did not know the time because there were no days and no nights in the murky tunnel. I think Mr Fox is whispering because he doesn't want to risk getting caught or one of the farmers hearing him. Question three. The thing that Mr Fox says, which lets the reader know that the tunnel came out exactly where he had planned it, was, it's exactly what I was aiming at. I hit it slap in the middle. How does Roald Dahl describe how the little foxes react? react? So Roald Dahl describes the little foxes as going wild with excitement, running around in different directions and chasing the chickens. And um, question five, the word plump means fat or round. So your th- additional questions your brain power questions why do you think the work went much more slowly when digging this tunnel compared to the previous tunnel use page 37 to help you with that one question seven why might Roald Dahl have chosen to use so many exclamation marks and italics on page 40 and question eight how has Mr Fox's attitude changed when compared to how he was feeling yesterday Okay, how do you know and why do you think this is? So pause the video now, have a go answering your questions. Okay, good job guys. So why do you think the work went much more slowly? Okay, so you should have started your answer. I think the work went much more slowly this time because... Okay. This one is a little bit of common sense okay using what you've read before so it's contextual okay you've got your quote here the work went much more slowly now okay yet they kept at it with great courage okay so courage means that even though they might have been scared 
even though they might have been tired they still carried on okay so something along the lines of i think the work went much more slowly this time because the foxes were tired from all of the digging they had done before would be an okay answer okay why might Roald Dahl have chosen to use so many exclamation marks and italics? So you can see here, look, I've done it. I've done it first time. I've done it. I've done it. So he repeats himself. Okay. That tells us as the reader, using the italics and the repetition, that the way in which Mr. Fox is saying something. Okay. You could tell that when I read it. I've done it, he yelled. We're told there he yelled, okay? I've done it first time. So you can tell from that that he's rather proud of himself that he's got that first time, okay? And again, I've done it, I've done it. You can tell from here, come up, come up and see where you are, my darlings. What a sight for a hungry fox, hallelujah, hooray, hooray. All these exclamation marks give the reader the impression that Mr. Fox is really, really happy, really excited. It conveys that really well to us. Okay, so that, I think, is why Roald Dahl chose to use so many exclamation marks and italics. Also, if you have a quick look down here, he does it again. It's exactly what I was aiming at. I hit slap in the middle, first time. Isn't that fantastic? And, so you've got your bracket, um, your italics there again, and, if I say so, rather clever. It's not often, guys, that you would call yourself clever. So Mr. Fox is obviously really proud of himself that he's, he's managed to, to hit the nail on the head and get to the place that he wanted to go to. Okay, and question eight. How has Mr. Fox's attitude changed when compared to how he was feeling yesterday? How do you know and why do you think this? So again, there's not a um, a piece, a, a, a certain page you need to look at for this. It's just what you have read today compared to what you read yesterday. So Mr. Fox's attitude has changed because yesterday he felt, cast your mind back to how he felt when he was down the hole and those monstrous machines were trying to get in, to get him and his family. How did he feel? Today he feels how? Okay, so they're quite different, the emotions that he's feeling. Okay, so have a go at answering that question. Hey guys, I hope you found yesterday's work okay, doing the problems. We're actually going to continue with that today. Um, but let's just first of all go through our answers from our do it and secure it. So, calculate the missing numbers as your first part. So, £10 takeaway for something is £3.82. You could have used the number line here, or you could have turned them into pence and done it that way. Um, but the answer you should have got was £6.18. Something divided by 10 equals 20 pence. So, you should have done 20 pence times 10, and hopefully you got £2. Number two. Ron has £48. He spends one quarter of his money. How much does he have left? Use the bar model to help. So I'm hoping you did 48 divided by 4 because we all know a quarter is um, one fourth, basically. So 48 divided by 4 is 12. So each of those parts is 12. And then you do 48 to take away 12 and your answer is £36. Um, the table below shows the entrance prices for the fun fair. How much would it cost for one adult and two children to visit the fun fair during the week? So the first thing you should have done is find out how much it is for the two children. So £7.75 and £7.75, which is equal to £15.50. Then one adult is £15.50. And then you need to add those two together. So your answer was £31. If you then challenge yourself and do the extra challenge, you already know that in the week it's £31. So you would have done the same thing but for the weekend. So £9.25 at £9.25. And then you would have added £18.50. You would have got that the weekend is equal to £37. £37 take away £31 equals 
£10. OK, hopefully we all got that. OK, then, let's have a little look at our securing. So we talked about the fact that Bethan loved biscuits and she was going to have a tea party and she was going to buy 10 individual biscuits and we needed to decide whether that was her best decision. So the first thing I would have done is 10 times 30, which is 300. So 300 pence, which is the same as three pounds, okay? So then we can need to look at whether if she bought the five pack, it would be better. Now, 10 divided by five is two, so she would need two of those five packs. So we would do two pounds, one pound, which is equal to two pounds. So I would hope for your secure answer, you would have put something like, I disagree with her because it would be better value for her to buy two of the five packs rather than ten individual biscuits. She would be saving a pound. So anything along those lines would have been great. Okay, so today's online learning is we're going to continue solving problems with money. Now, my input is quite short. I'm just going to go over with you how to solve your do it for today. And then I'm going to leave you to it because um, I spoke a lot yesterday and I just want to give you the opportunity to really practice your skills. But first, I want you to have a little go at this problem. So, Les has £36. After he has visited the shop, he has a quarter of his money left. How much did he spend? So what I'd like to do is pause me and have a go, and then when you're ready, come back and I'll go through it with you. Okay, so the first thing that you would need to do is £36 divided by 4 to find out what that quarter was. Okay, so we know that 36 divided by 4 is 9. Then to find out how much he'd spent, that was the other three quarters, you could have done 9 times 3, which would have given you 27, or you could have done 36 take away 9, which would have still given you 30, 27, sorry. So the answer is 27, okay? And it's a bit of a trick one, that one, because similar to ones we did yesterday, but slightly different. Okay, so this is very similar to your do it that you're going to have today. Um, so I thought it'd be good if we did one together and then you can go ahead and have a go all by yourself. Okay, so you've been given a table here with four items on and then the total and you've been given one of the prices. You've been told that the chocolate is 50 pence. It's then your job to fill in the rest of the table. Okay. Okay, so we've got to use the information to complete the price list. The water costs 40p more than the ice lolly, okay? Now, we don't have the information about the ice lolly, so we'll leave that one for now. The ice lolly is double the price of the chocolate, but we do know the price of the chocolate. So we need to do 50 pence times by two because it's double the price. And we know that 250 pence is the same as a pound, okay? So we know now that the ice lolly costs a pound. So if we go back to the first one, it said... The water costs 40 pence more than the ice lolly. So we need to do one pound and 40 pence, which is one pound 40 pence. That's how much the water costs. Okay, and the final one says the newspaper is the price of the water and chocolate together. So you need to add that one pound 40 and the 50p together. 50 and 0 0.50. Okay, so zero add zero is zero. 5 add 4 is 9, 1 add 0 is 1, so the newspaper must be £1.90, okay? So to work out the total, we need to add all of those numbers up together, okay? Now, the easiest way to do this, I would say, is to convert them into pence so that we've got um, three-digit numbers and two-digit numbers to add rather than decimal points, okay? So it will look something like this. Now, you don't have to do it this way. You can do it step by step. So the pound and the 50p, add them together, then add them to another thing. That's absolutely fine. But I'm just going to do it this way just to show you all um, just quickly. So four zeros added together makes zero. Nine add four is 13. Add five is 18. So remember, we put our eight here and we exchange that extra 10 over. And then 1, add 1 is 2, add 1 is 3, add that 1 is 480. Now that is pence, so we need to convert that into our pounds, and the total would be £4.80. 
Just as a quick extra there for you, I'd like you to pause me and have a go. If you'd got five pounds, how much would your change be? When you think you've worked it out, come back, okay? 20 pence would have been your answer. Okay, guys, because remember, there's 100 pennies in a pound. And we've got 80 pence, so we just need 20 more pence to get to five pounds. Okay? Okay, then, guys, so you'll do it today. You have got Dora's receipt. She's had a sandwich, some orange juice, some crisps, and a banana. Her crisps cost her 60 pence, and it's your job to find out the price of all the other items and the total. Okay? So you need to use the information here to complete the receipt. The sandwich costs £2.15 more than the crisps. The orange juice is the same price as the crisps and banana together. And the banana is half the price of the crisps. Okay, so you've got some dividing, some adding and taking away there. So hopefully that is challenging for you. And you've got your total box there. So you've got to add them all together for her final price. Now, if you do that and you think I need more of a challenge, great. I've put on popped an extra challenge at the bottom here so i've got five pounds how much change would i get if i bought one of each item could i afford to buy anything else with my change okay so good luck with that we'll go through the answers for this one on monday all right okay guys and so for your secure it dexter buys a teddy bear for six pounds a board game for four pounds a cd for five pound fifty and a box of chocolates for two pound fifty he has some discount vouchers he can either get £10 off or pay half price for his items. Which voucher would save him more? Explain your thinking. So the first step of your problem I would recommend is to find out the total that he spent. And then you can work out what it would be £10 less and what it would be half price and decide which is the best deal for him. Okay, we'll go through the answers for this on Monday. Good luck, guys. If you've got any problems or you're really confused or anything like that, just please send me an email. I'm here to help, okay? I look forward to seeing you on Monday because we're starting our new topic of time, which is exciting. Have a fab weekend, guys. Bye. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to your writing session. Um, I hope you're really excited to carry on with that piece of discussion writing that we're going to do in a minute. Um, but we're going to start our session as we always do with that bit of sentence, Doctor. We're thinking about that punctuation again. Again, like I said to you yesterday, I've got you a lovely bit of a challenge today. Um, there are eight punctuation mistakes to find in this sentence. It's not my fault, May grumbled. Stephen did it first. And what I'd like you to do is pause the video, copy out the sentence, correct all the punctuation mistakes that you can find. Remember, you're looking for eight and then come back to me once you've done it. Pause the video. OK, did you manage to spot all eight of the mistakes? Let's have a little look. So started off again. It was a speech marks that was in. We've got speech again, but it's in two halves. It's not my fault, Stephen did it first, or our, is our speech. One set of speech marks around, it's not my fault. And the second set of speech marks between, behind, round Stephen did it first. Remembering that once we start our speech marks, we've got a capital letter, that was one was included. Um, we've got it's being, it is not my fault, so it's a contraction, so it's got our apostrophe because we're missing that it out, the I, so we've got a contraction apostrophe there. Remembering that when we've put our speech marks in, we have to put some punctuation in, otherwise the words all fall out, so we've got a comma because we're carrying on with this sentence after uh, May grumbled. May grumbled, again we need to cut her off that sentence so we can start our next one. Starting with speech, speech always starts with a capital letter, but even more so in this case because it's a name, a proper noun. So we've got the capital S and remembering to close that speech mark at the end. Hopefully you found all eight of those mistakes today um, and you've enjoyed going through our different bits of punctuation that we've been focusing on this week. So today we're carrying on with our discussion that we were writing yesterday. So our objective is to write an effective discussion. And we've been looking at those discussion texts and thinking about showing our reader both sides of the argument giving them lots and lots of information so that they can make up their own minds about the issue and our issue remember is should fox be shot or not so when we looked at the text we were looking at lots of different ways that the author had informed our reader um, and we said that they used facts and numbers such as 32 percent of animals were at risk 
He used persuasive language like minuscule cages and endangered species. We had a balanced number of arguments. Remember, we had three reasons for and three reasons against. We had the introduction, the conclusion. They gave us the opinion of experts, zoologist Matt Jenkins. And they also used those connectives, those conjunctions that we were talking about on Tuesday, Wednesday. On the other hand, and however, to give us those opposing arguments. So today, when we're writing our effective discussion, we've done our introduction, we wrote that yesterday, we're now on to our reasons for, our reasons against, and our conclusion. So we're going to write these two paragraphs first. Let's have a little look and remind ourselves what this could look like. So this was our zoos one that we were looking for, and as I'm reading it through, just be thinking to yourself, what has the author done that makes this writing effective that I perhaps can be thinking about of using in my own writing when I come to do that in a moment. So on the one hand, some people believe that zoos should be banned for good. Every day people can see or increase their knowledge of any wild animals in its natural habitat because they can simply tune into a TV programme or buy a video. This has led some animal rights activists to claim that zoos are out of date even though thousands of people visit them every year. They argue that it is extremely cruel to capture creatures from the wild, transport them over long distances and keep them holed up in minuscule cages or enclosures, just so human beings can be entertained. Shockingly, zoologist Matt Jenkins, who is a leading expert in this field, has stated that zoocosis, which is an abnormal behaviour like rocking or swaying, is often developed by captive animals which show they are bored and unhappy in their prison-like conditions. He therefore concludes that it is wrong to keep animals in environments which could cause such stress to them, even if zoos are trying their best to mimic what life might be like in the wild. So what I want you to do now is just pause the video, have a little read through. What has the author done that makes the writing effective? And are there any words or phrases that you think you might be able to borrow to magpie from this text and use in your writing when we should go to write about Mr Fox? Okay, let's see if you found any of these. So, you will notice that they had some adverbs of time in here, okay? And you notice the word every, every day, every year. So, we're trying to make sure that people understand this is always happening. So, we could say something in our text about every day, fox went out, goes out and steals more and more chickens. It's adding that bit of emotion to it. We've got that emotive language, this persuasion that we talked about. So, keep them holed up in minuscule cages, just so human beings can be entertained. A really important one. We've got that on the other hand. That was our oppositional conjunction that we were using there as well. We've got some more emotive language down at the bottom. Could cause stress to them. We talked about those coordinating conjunctions that in addition to. And we've got an evaluative adverb in there as well. So shockingly really helps to bring the argument home so this is our plan for our writing for our discussion so should fox be shot the farmers think yes and you've got some ideas in your book from yesterday and you were planning your argument but if you need some extras mine are on the screen as well and you're going to have a go now at writing two paragraphs one saying that foxes should be shot and giving me the reasons why, and one saying that foxes shouldn't be shot, giving me the reasons why. And what I'd like you to do is go back to the learning that we did on Wednesday and think about your conjunctions to add more information and your conjunctions to contrast. So when you're moving from one paragraph to the other paragraph, you're going to start with one of these. And when you're adding that those information, so we've got more than one reason we're going to be using those additional conjunctions here, okay? So leave this on the screen for yourselves, pause the video, have a go at writing your for paragraph and your against paragraph, okay? One paragraph of each, one with all the reasons why you want the fox shot and one with all the reasons why you don't want them shot. And remember to try and use some of those emotive language. Maybe you'll talk to an expert, maybe farmer bloggist will be in yours. 
maybe you'll um, give us some facts and figures as well. So pause the video and write your two paragraphs. Come back to me before you write your conclusion. Okay, fantastic job. I'm really, really excited to see what you've been writing about for your for and against paragraphs. We're going to move on now. I'm going to write our conclusion. We're going to write this together because it doesn't need to be very long, as you can see from the example on the screen. So in conclusion, having carefully considered both sides of the arguments, it seems that there are still arguments for retaining zoos. These should, however, be planned carefully with the animal's welfare in mind, because in a modern world, there is no excuse for keeping animals in cramped or cruel conditions. So if we have a think about our conclusion that we are going to write, it starts with a signpost. So something like in conclusion or to sum up or thinking about all of the issues or I can see why. So it gives us a clue that we are writing our conclusion. It sums up the argument and it gives the author's opinion and the reasons for this. So let's have a little go at writing this together to start with. OK, so we're going to need to start this section with a signpost. So we need to tell people that we are at the end of the con of the of the piece that we've been writing. Um, so I might use in conclusion. I could use to sum up. Um, I think I'm going to go with having considered both sides of the argument. I think that fox should not be shot to give him my author's opinion because he is trying his best to help his family and it is natural for foxes to eat chickens Okay, so I've started with a signpost. Yep, I've given my opinion and the reason for my opinion. I haven't really summed up both sides of the argument. Mm, I wonder if I could put something else in. Having considered both sides of the argument, um, it is clear that some people think that foxes should be shot, but other people think that they should not i think that fox okay let's read that through and see if that makes sense because i've done all three of the things that i needed to do in my conclusion so having considered both sides of the argument it is clear that some people think that foxes should be shot but other people think that they should not i think that fox should not be shot because he is trying his best to help his family and it is natural for foxes to eat chickens. What do you think? Does that work as a conclusion? Short, sums up the arguments, gives my point of view? Yeah, I think I'm okay with that. Okay, so now we've had a little look at my conclusion. Have a go at writing your own. It just needs to be a couple of sentences, nice and short, to the point. Start with one of the sentence starters on the screen to help you. Make sure you tell me what you think and why you think it, okay? So pause the video now and write your conclusion. Okay, so now you've written all of your text. You have your introduction that you wrote yesterday, you've got your main paragraphs that you wrote today, you've got a conclusion that we've written together. Have a little think, go back to it. Have you got an introduction? Have you got reasons for, reasons against? Have you got a conclusion? Have you got paragraphs that link those things together? Have you used those condition conjunctions, the opposition conjunctions that we talked about? Have you used some generalizers, some people, maybe? Have you used the present tense? Have you concluded the third person? I want you to think carefully about what you think you've done well in your writing and how you've made sure that writing is super effective. And always think about what you might do next time. But what I really, really, really want you to do, once you've gone through your work, you've edited it, you've made any changes that you need to make to make it absolutely super duper, 
is make sure that you send that writing to Miss Cunnington and Miss Foster because they are super excited to see how you've gotten on with your first discussion text. So it's year three at redbrookhays.staffs.sch.uk for Miss Cunnington and it's year four at redbrookhays.staffs.sch.uk for Miss Foster. We're really, really excited to see what you've been up to so make sure you do send those in photographs or if you've been typing um, you can send us the Word documents as well but we're really looking forward to that. So today's our final day with this particular connected curriculum topic. Remember that we've been talking about countries. We've been talking about the location of different countries and the location of different particular monuments or wonders of the world. Hopefully you have got enough time today to finish your challenge and make sure you send that over to us. We're looking for either some World of Wonders top trumps cards from you. We're looking for perhaps an information poster about one of the wonders of the world from you. Or we're looking for an interactive world map, either made on the computer or as a poster. It doesn't matter, but make sure that when you finish those projects today, that you send them across to Miss Cunnington and Miss Foster, because we've got a whole new set of challenges for you coming up next week, uh, which is all linked to the water cycle. And I know that you're going to have a really great time investigating and finding out all about it. So it just leaves me to say have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Um, we will see you back here on Monday with even more exciting lessons for you and we will see you very soon. Bye guys!